Welcome back, all my unconventional people out there. I got Oga Topchaya with us today, and she has founded a company called Lapis AI Consults, and she is a trailblazer trailblazer in the realm of technology and AI integration. We were just chatting how she went to school for English and got a graduate degree in marketing, but she became a mom, went at home, started thinking about what she's going to do next, and now she is in the AI space and building custom SaaS programs or something I don't know anything about, but she's going to share it all with us. So happy to have her on. And out of like, you're at, you became a mom, which is awesome. Congrats to that. You're staying at home doing the mom thing, which is probably way harder than dealing with AI in terms of uh, that mental shift. How, how did you come up with this idea in terms of everything while being at home with your, you had a son or a daughter, both? I, I have a son. Okay, so you didn't have twins. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No. <laughs> yeah, so like, that's really interesting. How did you decide you want to do this? Like, during that time, were you just like thinking about it because chat GPT got really popular? Or was it something you've like, were always interested in? I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear like how that happened. Sure. Um. So while I was on leave, um, my company actually ended up letting a ton of people go. It was like the worst tech recession at that point. Um, and I kind of began thinking, you know, where, where do I go next? What do I do? And uh, that's when I discovered large language models. So it was before the chat GPT boom. Uh, it was also by OpenAI, an older model. Uh, and that is now like a dinosaur. But instantly I knew that like this, whatever this is, this is going to be big. So I need to learn anything and everything that I possibly can. It was just completely mind blowing that I'm looking at this thing and it's creating brand new text for me. Right. Uh, now we look at it and we think, oh, yeah, obviously, of course. But a few years ago, that that wasn't the case. Right? It, was, it was very new. Um, and, uh, and my husband, he is a developer. And so I started asking him, Hey, do you know about this? This is amazing. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's a language model. Like everyone knows, you know, everyone in tech knows about this. That's not a big deal. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 this is a big deal. I know it. Um, and, uh, so I started meeting people in the space. I started, you know, just trying to talk to people. Uh, I did hackathons to learn more about the technology and really get, in the weeds of things. Um, and then I got my first gig as a prompt engineer. So having a background in English and in marketing was very helpful there. Um, and I was writing prompt templates uh, for Copy AI. And uh, then I ended up getting another contract for, uh, for a company also doing AI, but more on the product side. And then I got another contract and another contract. And these contracts just kept kind of coming up. So it was very clear that like people were not hiring full time, but they wanted consultants on a contract basis. And so I realized, all right, well now I need, it's time for me to actually start my own company, not just be like a in, you know independent contractor. Um, so I had the marketing background and the product background to help companies leverage AI on the business side. What I was lacking was the developer background to go a step beyond and actually build the product for companies. And this is where I started building out a team. Uh, so the people, all the people that I had met throughout my journey and the hackathons, they were very excited to join, um, you know, come on board. And, uh, and now we, what we do is we start with the business problem for a company. And then once we identify the problem and how AI can solve it, we build a solution. So we're making sure that we're very realistic in what it is that we can build, but we're not just going off and saying, okay, sure, like this is what you want. We'll go and build it for you. But really digging deep into the issue that a company is facing. What's the most simple way you can explain what like SaaS AI is to someone who has no idea what that means? Yeah, it's um, you're bu building a custom program for mm -hmm. yourself. Right, custom compute computer software that is very heavily incorporates AI, although it can incorporate other things. Um, so some examples might be an AI assistant 
that helps with uh, ticket, like uh, tech ticket support, right? Or an AI assistant that will help with customer uh, retention, customer acquisition by helping answer questions that customers have instead of, of like going to an FAQ, for example, right, page and scrolling down. A customer can just come and ask questions they have about your company, about your product, and then suggest products to them. So there's a sales element as well. Um, so, the, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of softwares you can use it for, like data analysis, for example. So you can load up all your data um, and, and maybe connect to other data sources. And then we use AI to make sense of it, right, to give you some of the insights. So everything that we do, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's tools out there that do similar things. But what we do is custom. And mm -hmm. we identify, help you with your business problem and then build that custom solution for you. So it's, it's computer software, AI, <laughs> you know, many different forms of AI, including traditional AI. Right. So when you're like meeting with a company that has no AI and they have no idea how this works, what's, what have you been finding is like a common trend that you're helping these companies build to increase their productivity, their efficiency, you know, answering questions for potential customers or helping put out minor fires for existing customers. But ultimately, sometimes AI can only take you so far, but it can be a good like moat around your company as a good line of defense. Is there are, is there like a trend or is it all random? Tell me more. There's so uh, there's a few use cases that I think are the most popular right now. Um, one is surrounding your data, your own data. So you go to ChatGPT or Claude, you know, that's fine, right? But they're not, they're trained on just general data. What we can do is we can link it to your own information. So it can be anything from you know, Word documents and PDFs to more structured data like Excel, for example. And then you can use it to either draw insights about any topic, essentially, right? Whether it's customer behavior, um, whether it's market trends, market analysis, right? Or about your employees, you know, what are maybe the kind of things that they're struggling with based on what kind of questions they are asking about you know, maybe whether it's uh, HR related questions or tech support questions, um, maybe it's upskilling your employees. So instead of them, you know, being told, hey, go take this class or coming to you, you know, for, you know, you have a junior employer and then they're coming with like a bunch of questions every 15 minutes or, you know, a new employee and they don't know where something is located. So they come to you every 15 minutes, right? Um, they, and it can be disruptive, right? So instead of that, you can have AI and they can go and ask those questions. So everything is surrounding internal data and optimizing your performance with that information using something like a large language model to uh, to get those answers. I've played around with some of them. I saw something called like Air AI, where it's like AI that will do like phone calls for you. And you can like okay. upload like information about your company, like typical questions that people ask, objections, answering and you can upload it and it could like learn and essentially you can call people for like pennies on the dollar uh i don't think it's like quite where it needs to be to be like 100 percent effective i the the uh i saw an ad though on instagram and it was uh for the um new google was it the google goggles or the apple goggles and like they were doing like automated calls they'd be like hi Oga, we saw that you didn't buy the uh you know new headset but it was in your cart, like any particular reason why. And the person's like, man, I'm not paying $4,000 for these goggles. My man. He's like, my man. He kept calling him my man. He goes, <laughs> and But then like the language model goes, well, have you heard about like our financing programs? And it was, it was interesting. Um, if they can like make them really good. However, like on the flip side, like 
what happens when those systems like fail? Is there like a, any downside risk to that, that sort of model that you've seen? Um, or is it because you're in a custom space that you're building a custom solution for someone so that they don't have the same mistakes that like a cookie cutter AI system has? Like maybe talk about the difference between like cookie cutter as AI, which is like chat GPT versus like what you're doing, because I think that's an important distinction to make in the marketplace. Sure, absolutely. Um, so let me start with saying that no AI and no technology is perfect. No just person's like no, perfect either. Right? Like just like humans, we're not perfect. So you can get, you know, 95 to 99% accuracy, but you'll never have 100%, right? Just it's impossible. Um, but you can get close. You can certainly get close. Um, so just keeping that in mind that errors, are going to happen no matter what. Uh, having said that, what we do, how it's different is we, without getting too technical, we restrict it to only the companies, to only your knowledge base. So that significantly will reduce its, uh, it's called hallucination, right? So for it going and like making something up. Mm -hmm. It would significantly, significantly reduce that as opposed to something like ChatGPT. Um, so that is certainly like one major distinction. Uh, the other thing is that we rely on the customer's data, right? So the better the data that they give us, the better the output is going to be, right? Um, so those those are really like the, the two main differences between something like ChatGPT uh, and what we do. Uh, but there's many other providers out there that, you know, maybe like this AI, for example, right? Um, I'm personally not familiar with them. I, I don't know how effective they are, but there are certainly many other providers that are kind of off the shelf. Uh, the problem that a lot of companies will face there is with scalability. So once they want to get to a certain size and roll out the solution to people, you know, enough people, things begin to break down or they begin to get really, really expensive for them. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is that they'll seldom get like exactly what it is that they're looking for, right? So anything from having your own branding to how you want the AI to respond in what, you know, what level of technicality or detail you want it to go into um, to what kind of insights or what kind of analytics you get. You know, some off-the-shelf products will give you, you know, maybe five or 10 or 15 different kinds of analytics. For us, it's infinite, right? Where it, it's, you know, there, there's a lot that we can build. Um, integration, right? So a lot of them, some of them will, but a lot of them won't or won't integrate with the kind of tools that you are using on a day-to-day -day basis. We can integrate with it. So it really will help get the kind of output that a company is looking for to minimize that, that risk. You, you still want a person to look at it, 100%. You never want to leave everything you know, 100% to an AI and then come back a year later, right? So you should still have a person being in the loop to verify things. Um, we can do things like, Link citations, for example. So when the ad gives an output, it'll say, hey, this is the document that I got it from. And so a person can go and click on it and see, oh, is this like actually correct, right? So there's ways, there's, there's certain guardrails that we can put into place that maybe don't exist with off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard some people who are like notable investors say, it's still like nine o'clock and this AI party is going to like four in the morning from where you're seeing, like, where do you feel like we're at and what is the next evolution of AI? Because it does seem like we're still a little bit early, even though I've had a couple people on the podcast who are implementing AI and everyone knows like artificial intelligence has been around since like the fifties in some sort of capacity It's just now starting to get into the hands of, uh, everyday people such as myself, where I had some shrimp and I told chat GPT what ingredients I had. And I said, Hey, what kind of marinade can I make with these ingredients for shrimp? Yep. Pretend you're Emerald. 
And it said, if I was Emerald, here's the marinade. And it said, do a teaspoon of that, tablespoon of that, do this, do that, whisk it. And then boom, I had my marinade. Great. And how did it taste? I haven't eaten it yet. So I'll let you know when I have it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm, right. letting, I'm letting it, I'm letting it marinate 24 hours. I'm giving it some time. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Send me the recipe. I'm curious too. Okay. I will. <laughs> um, so I think that we are absolutely still early on. Um, things are developing still pretty, you know, a pretty exponential rate. Um, some things have slowed down. Uh, so I, I'll, you'll probably hear conflicting responses from people in the AI industry. I've heard people say, oh, we're entering an AI winter. I don't think that that's true. I think there are certain developments that are happening at a slower rate. But then there's others that are evolving more quickly. So, for example, like on the hardware side, we are beginning to see more advanced hardware, which as a result can help the software develop. Right. Mm -hmm. um, also, just the fact that um, the theory there's maybe there's less uh, academic research coming out in a way. Right. But companies are now implementing it more and more and more companies are implementing it. But we, there's still plenty of companies that don't even understand what ChatGPT is or what Claude is or the fact that there's even a thing called Claude, right? Which, which is, you know, if there are listeners who don't know, then it's uh, also another form of new uh, AI. And it is fantastic, very similar to ChatGPT, but with slightly different training. Um, so... In in the business, in the business realm, that I think we are still early. There's still a lot of companies that are not implementing it yet because either they don't know or because they're afraid. They they don't want to take you know new things are scary. New things can be risky, right? Um. So in that sense, we're still pretty early on. Mm -hmm. The way I see it, from a company point of view is if I want to start implementing AI and I want, and if correct me if I'm like completely wrong, but my view is you first test it with your employees and see what systems you can fix within your organization to speed up the productivity of your employees. So for example, let's just say oh, you and me work at a, a bank and I'm the teller and you're the, the mortgage person and someone comes in and is like, hey, what are the rates? I'd be like, well, you have to talk to Oga. She's the mortgage person. She has all the you know, the info that I don't have access to versus now someone comes in and is like, hey, Josh, what's the rates? I could literally just say to a little chat bot, hey, like, what are the current rates that we're offering on a 15 and 30 year mortgage? And I'd be like, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Client, like, here's the current rates. Like, you want to schedule a time with Oga? So it's speeding up that process just in little ways. And when you have a large company or a small company, whether you're saving five seconds or five minutes a day at scale and you compound that until the end of time, how much time that could save a company translates to, you know, better revenues and a thriving economy. Absolutely. Um, there's no question about it. And the the example you gave is a fantastic example. <laughs> um, I, I really, it's, you know, because you're, you're still keeping the human in the loop, right? And you're you're making the person better. And that's kind of the idea. And I think that's really the goal is to improve people, improve how people work, you know, how, how things operate on a day to day. And obviously that will translate into companies improvement, economic improvement. So hundred percent, I agree with you there. Um, you know, for on the client side, right, you can run small tests. So you don't need to roll it out to every single person that comes to your website, right? You can have, you know, like a portion of your traffic only that sees some kind of AI uh, communication from you, right? Maybe it's an assistant mm -hmm. or something else. Or if you're like automating your emails with AI and implementing the messaging, you can also only do it to like a specific portion. So there you're kind of minimizing the risk, right? You're running some tests, 
And then when you see the outputs, you can roll it out to your customers. So some things you can automate all together. Uh, like, you know, instead of a person coming to your e-commerce site and searching for the perfect pair of shoes, they can ask the AI to find them the shoes that match the following criteria. Maybe your filters don't do a good job at filtering out. I've been seeing that my website in particular has been getting like spammed as like AI generated. Like Google has been like saying this is AI generated, like on a blog post that I didn't use any AI on. And then what I'm finding is even if you're using some like images that you pay for, like pro or whatnot, some of the crawlers on the indexing are like saying, oh, this is AI generated. Have do you have any experience of working with that and how like people that are in business or with websites can work around that? The short answer is no, because <laughs> uh, all these AI detection solutions, the, every single one of them that I've come across is really bad at detecting what is and what isn't AI generated. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been writing you know blog posts using AI, but I know how to write them in such a way that they won't become... Uh, detected as AI generated content because I see AI generated content across the board. But then there's other things, you know, I wrote like some time ago, I was just completely curious and I ran it through the AI detection and it's like, yeah, this is generated by AI. Why? Because maybe it's using some certain words like um, delve or transform, you know, like some of, sometimes these kind of uh, phrases or words or, you know, they'll, they'll trigger this, um, you know, this detection process. That's not always true, right? Um, unfortunately, there's no good response here. The best that I can say is don't rely exclusively on Google to get the word out about your customers. Mm -hmm. That I think is true of any marketing that you do have been or have done over the last 20 years that Google's been around, don't rely only on Google. Um, I think people are turning to other sources to find out, you know, content, especially, you know, younger generation. You can look at Instagram and, you know, various social channels, for example, right? LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, so I really would encourage people to just don't rely on Google. They're Going downhill, SEO is becoming harder and harder to do all across the board. Um, paid ads are becoming really expensive. So, you know, maybe take a step back from Google altogether. Mm -hmm. What's making you saying Google's going downhill? Um, so it's been, it's been a trend for a while. Um, they have decreased the number of uh search like search result clicks because their goal is to keep you on the google uh ecosystem right including including youtube including youtube exactly so um when you do a search result you'll see like the the answers right like the the snippets the yeah, i'm starting to see those ones. ai generated ones at the top and now is the ai generated ones right and and so it's, I think as, you know, as of like a couple of years ago, it was only, it was like 50% of traffic resulted in a click, you know, that's, and now I don't, I don't know what it is now. I haven't looked into it recently, but I imagine with the AI responses, it's probably even significantly more than that. Right. Um, so I don't know exactly what percent of people will scroll down below that but like you you know you'll see like it, it's paid results will come up first um well first the answers will come up from google then you'll have like youtube then you'll have only then you'll have like paid results and only then you'll get some kind of content that's like seo content okay um so it's it's been going down for a while on um you know, on the user side and the custom, the Google customer side for businesses. And now they have started pouring all their money into AI, but their core business is still from ads. And so it's kind of beginning to like cannibalize, you know, their, their main source of business because nobody's 
paying or not as much for AI, right? You're paying it more on the consumer side, maybe like 20 bucks a month. Um, and then, you know, on the enterprise side, maybe you're paying some some amount for integrating the AI into your workflow. But at the end of the day, they are panicking. They are struggling because AI is just cannibalizing everything. People are turning to ChatGPT more to find answers and to Claude and to Bing and to perplexity. We haven't seen the exact like impact of it just yet. Uh, if you look at like the search engine um, traffic, then Google is still like, the highest one by far but i think we're just we're headed in that direction it's inevitable it's been going on for a while mm, yeah someone asked me about that the other day because i like google as a company and like they are in the ai space they're like you know google is not doing great in the ai space i go well yeah but at the same time google is google there's going to be delay and people even like you know we're still in the early phases of AI. So you're having people who are still Googling things and they're, they're always going to Google things. But then they also have the YouTube, which like every child, it seems like under the age of 12, wants to be a YouTuber. They all love <laughs> YouTube. And then they also have been shifting over to more like, I think they just closed like a deal with NFL Sunday ticket. So obviously as a company, they've evolutionized. But like for the right. small business owner, or the person who has a dream of starting a business, and since you have a background in marketing and now you're, uh, on the front lines of AI, what can what can the every person, everyday person do? Um, with with Google or sorry, just in, with, just in general to like get the word out. Like, let's just say I'm a 17 year old girl and I make really cool shoes. Like, how do I get the word out about my cool shoes other than just posting the Instagram or TikTok and hoping I go viral a few times where I can get some sales? Um. It depends on what it is that you're selling. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out who are you selling it to? Why would they be interested in it? And then where do these people hang out? Right. Maybe it has to be a face to face thing, like a you know, real, real world thing, right? Maybe you hold some um pop up shop kind of event, for example. Um, maybe you know you you just start with like Etsy, you know, depend, depending on what it is you're, you're doing. Mm. So there's, you know, maybe you start with the on campus, right? And then maybe you go to another campus, right? So you need to start thinking, who are you selling to? Where are these people at? And what makes your product interesting? Not just like, hey, I think it's cool. Right. But what problem is this product solving? You know, mm -hmm. are, are other shoes like not as pretty? Right. Are your shoes the prettiest ones out there? You know, or what, what is different about it in some way? Uh, and then and then you can think of getting the word out, um, you know, for us, like we use LinkedIn, which is, you know, helpful, but it's still a very saturated space. So I found more. In, you know niche communities and uh, like Slack groups and Discord, where I will post about my company or where I will post about an event that I'm holding, and get people to the event. Then from there, you know they see that I know what I'm talking about. They can get value out of the content that I'm presenting, and then beyond that, they you know we can maybe schedule a meeting, right? So. I don't just go and try to advertise on Google um, or or on Instagram, right? Because that's not where my audience really is. So you need to just think of more creative ways beyond that. Mm -hmm. Right. So are you seeing that more of like the online advertising, like it's just become so saturated that you have to look into more unconventional routes at this point in time, or just yeah. like, do a little bit there, but not go all in and figure out where you're, where everyone's hanging out that you're looking to get in connection with, whether it's going to a in-person conference or if you're selling uh, cookies, like going to where people love cookies. Yeah. Um, I, it depends on your budget and it depends on your product because mm. ads are expensive. I know Google and and this goes same thing for Facebook ads and for Instagram ads and LinkedIn ads. Ads are expensive. 
I know that there's this idea that like, oh, it's only like $50. It's absolutely not. If you want to come up on the first page, if you want people actually seeing your ad. So it depends on how much you are willing to spend. And then you probably need also a person that knows what they're doing when it comes to ads, because trying to do it, there's a lot of levers that you can pull and buttons you can press and a lot of approaches that you can take to advertising. And there's a reason why you know, demand gen marketers exist, right? And it's their entire profession. So I would still recommend hiring somebody to do that. Um, if you don't have the budget before ads, and if you don't have the budget to hire someone to do a good job <laughs> with the ads, then yes, I would recommend trying more unconventional ways. And well, you can start with asking ChatGPT, you know, here's my product. Here is who I'm trying to target. You know, here is the budget that I have and them and you know the resources and the time that I have because you don't have infinite time to only do marketing, right? Um, you know, what are some ways that you can suggest, right? And then play around with the prompts. Prompt engineering is a skill in and of itself. Yeah, learning to delegate is a ta- is a skill within itself, and knowing what's a priority now versus like must-haves versus nice-to-haves, especially when you're first starting out. And with your AI company starting out versus what you're looking to do heading into next year, is there anything that people need to educate themselves on AI that hasn't been released yet that you're able to share, like what to look out for since you're on the, uh, you're in the battlegrounds? Yeah. Um, so I think there's... um there's going to be more of a shift in using AI for data analysis. Um, and let me rephrase that. When I say using AI, I mean the new wave of AI because AI has been used for data analysis for decades, but using the new wave of AI in natural language for data analysis. Um, LLMs up until you know very recently were, were not very good at that, but right now there are certain tools that you can implement that LLMs are uh, able to implement that can help you with the data analysis and it can give you do data science for you by writing the code. So this is just it's it's available now. It's something that we can do now and something that you can try yourself even on ChatGPT if you have the paid subscription, you can just see how it works by uploading like an Excel file, for example and ask it to give you some like data insights. And, and that uses a feature that's it's called Code Interpreter, uh, but it's something that's going to just continue to evolve. You just reminded me of something I read. I can't remember the book, but it reminded me of Target. How Target can know based on what a woman is purchasing that she is pregnant. Yes, yes. Using so- like the data of their purchases. And this was like the book was written before AI like hit yeah. the main stage. So like companies are using that. So, I mean, if you're going to a store and you're entering your phone number, there's a reason they're asking for the number because they want to know what you're buying, why you're buying it. And then they're going to send you those coupons because they know exactly the typical time of when those products are going to run out. And if they send you that coupon, you're more inclined to go to their store versus... uh all the other choices we have now nowadays between Amazon, Target, Walmart, Costco, Sam's Clubs, and then we could probably go on for another three minutes and probably <laughs> still leave a lot of things off the list. Yeah, and the you know the tar- the Target um, story is a very very famous one, I think, in the business. Yeah, world. like you, you know what I'm talking about, right? I know exactly what you're talking about, and um, you know it was too good, right? Because people people got scared, and I think it was like. The the specific example was that uh, I think it was like a teenage girl or a young girl that was pregnant and uh, she got the magazine for the, you know, from Target regarding those coupons and her father found out and it was it was just like blew up in Target's face. Right. So then they started pulling back and. You know, not just showing you like baby stuff, but also like electronics, right? So that they're not so transparent about, um, you know, how much they know about you. So 
yes, this has been around for a while and large enterprises have been doing this for a while. The difference now is that you need significantly less resources and you than you did in the past to have advanced analytics that you can either do yourself or you know you can scale it but you don't need millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and you know pe people with phds to sit there and do this for you right that's the difference yeah i remember reading the book uh why right brainers will rule the world by daniel pink and he was talking about anything that's a left brain activity could be outsourced so if you're doing any sort of job that's like all analytics it could be outsourced elsewhere now we're seeing those jobs are being replaced by ai so how could someone who's maybe like more left brain start to shift to the more creative side to ensure that their job isn't taken over by uh the machine um so i will say that ai can make if if you are good at your job ai will make you better if you're not good at your job then ai will replace you so your best bet is to get good at using ai so if there are those creative elements then you can leverage ai to help you develop those and look cre you know creatives are also becoming obsolete in some cases right and AI will definitely put a lot of people out of work. And, you know, it's it's a sad truth, but it's the case. But then again, you know, so did like the horse and buggy, it became obsolete, right? So this this happens and maybe it's happening at a different scale, but this happens when with any technology that it comes out. We've been losing jobs to automation for centuries, essentially. I right? um, you know, but if you're more analytical then you can get good at using ai and uh you know think about how you can apply your analytical thinking to become more creative ask ai right have it can de design you know maybe some like brainstorming exercises for you um to you know to open up Th that kind of brainwave pattern you know maybe there's you know reading poetry for example right like there's so it, and it may come up with some ideas that i can't think about but like i know reading poetry will definitely get your creative juices flowing <laughs> well that's awesome anyone that needs help building custom ai SaaS solutions for what kind of companies are you working with small medium large all um, we we mostly work with medium, so medium to large companies. Um, we have like pre-built solutions that small businesses can use, which you know, which are much more affordable. Um, and we tend to focus on medium to large companies. Yeah, I checked out your company, and you have everything from like a few hundred dollars a month to a lot more. So obviously, you have systems and demos, so you can try it before you buy it. And if you end up hating it after a couple months, you've only you're only out hundreds of dollars instead of tens of thousands of dollars like some products are. So, so happy to have you on and share all of your insights and we'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone. Bye.